Chaud mon 52 000. Absolument. Ouais, ouais. Ouais. <rire> Suite à cet échauffement de voix et de vocalise, bonjour à tous et toutes. Je suis ravi de, de vous retrouver après cette, cette soirée. Euh, donc, euh, on est là aujourd'hui pour euh, entendre, écouter euh, Mitch euh, du studio euh, Dia. Nous avons Meg aussi, la responsable de. Put your hands up! <rire> et euh, donc, euh, Dia Studio, en fait, euh, je dirais pas que c'est une love story, enfin, moi, tout, tous les gens avec qui euh, nous avons l'habitude de collaborer, généralement, je les aime, euh, aime d'amour. Et, euh, et travailler avec euh, Dia, euh, pour nous, en fait, d'où est venue euh, cette, euh, cette collaboration. Ils étaient invités, voici euh, deux ans, à participer à la dernière euh, biennale. Et euh, les rapports étaient euh, tellement euh, fluides et sympathiques, et donc toutes les questions de programmation, d'animation, Mitch le dira mieux que moi, en fait, ce qu'ils font, en fait, ce ne sont pas que des lettres qui bougent. C'est vraiment une question de musique, de son, euh, et de euh, un rapport au jazz euh, tout, tout simple. Et, et c'est ce qu'on nous dit souvent dans, dans l'image, en fait, ce n'est pas qu'une question euh, de forme, de superposition, c'est vraiment des histoires d'agencement, de respiration, euh, de rythme accentué, d'objets qui descendent, et ça, c'est quelque chose euh, que je n'avais trouvé à l'époque que chez eux, mais ils ont fait école depuis. Et, euh, et donc, euh, dans, dans cette idée de, de, de partenariat, parce qu'on voulait aussi traiter forcément de l'image imprimée, mais aussi des nouveaux territoires de l'image, qu'ils soient euh, interactives, euh, interactivité exogène, endogène, tout ça. Euh, mais ça, vos profs euh, parleront de, de tout ça euh, à l'école, quoi. Euh, et euh, ce, qui, ce qui était véritablement intéressant dans, dans cette relation, c'est comment travailler à distance, euh, nous, en tant que, que provinciaux euh, français, et travailler avec un studio new-yorkais avec tous les problèmes de décalage horaire, de jet lag et compagnie. Et chance pour nous, en fait, ils ont déménagé le studio à Genève, donc à 3 heures, heures d'ici. Donc c'est ce qui m'avait convaincu de montrer justement un autre pan du graphisme, donc on a moins l'habitude de, de voir. Et ce qui est intéressant dans leur pratique, ils vont montrer, enfin eux, ils travaillent dans des échelles new-yorkaises, enfin c'est Times Square, et, et, et l'idée c'était comment est-ce qu'on est qu fait venir New York dans un petit endroit qui est, qui est Chaumont et justement ça fait aussi partie du, du programme, enfin de l'ambition euh, de cette biennale. Euh, C'est véritablement d'avoir toutes les échelles euh, et tous les studios et participer à des rencontres. Euh, voilà, tout simplement. Merci. C'est à vous. Merci, merci. <rires> C'est un honneur d'être ici aujourd'hui. Merci pour l'introduction, Jean-Michel. Et un grand merci pour l'équipe, um, la scène, pour la letting us have this opportunity. Um, it's funny because uh, Jean-Michel, uh, he sent me a Facebook messenger. Hey, do you, do you think you'd be interested in doing the Biennale? And I didn't know. I was like, wow. Absolutement, oui. Um, so that's how it all started. And, Now we're here today. So I think, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the identity for the, the Biennale, um, but I think to give the proper context, you need to have a more, a larger understanding of how the studio works and how kind of the, the histoire uh, of me, a Meg, a Dia Studio, so you can get the full context of the work. Malheureusement, je n'ai pas le français well, so I'm going to speak English and I will try to be clear. Um, I have a tendency to speak very fast because I get very excited. So, <laughs> désolé. Um, all right, je commence. Um, okay, this guy, he's in the posters if you look closely. So, um, 
I'm a jazz pianist and musician first. I started playing when I was super young, I'll get into that. But this idea of improvisation and being able to just react in time in the moment, I find really interesting in the context of all the things you do. I'm, improvis I'm improv improvising right now. I have no idea what I'm gonna tell you today. Um, a little bit. But this thing that happens now, there's things that happened before us, there's things that happened after this point in time, and then it's just how to navigate this moment in time, just like those musicians were playing. If you notice the, the looks on their face and where they were performing, they were clearly not self-conscious of that activity. They were so engrossed into it that I think it's fascinating to find some way of a creative practice, and no, no matter what we do, whether it's design, music, art, to find this space of concentration and focus that we can just make stuff and freely. So this kind of idea, this input-output improvisation really embodies the whole way that the studio works. So this is life experience, theory, research, practice, all the things that we do up until this day are in the context of how we work. It's beyond just fonts, colors, and stuff. Me eating a croissant this morning may affect this experience in some way. So after that, you know, something happens, you make some posters, you do some work, you can, you can take a step back and then look at that. The thing is, for me, there needs to be a clear separation between the after and before. So when I'm making, there is no, there is no critical mind, there's nothing happening. I'm just doing in the moment, just having fun, enjoying that time. So that's really important for me to set that up. So I'm gonna talk about the input. So as Meg raised her hand, this is the the formation of Dia Studio, we were started in 2009, and then uh, the team expanded. Here's the rest of the crew outside of our old Dumbo office. That's Daniel and Deanna, and yeah, we keep it professional with our photos, as you can tell. Um, and then, of course, Layla. She's actually hanging out in the hotel room right now. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if they allow dogs in the auditorium, but she would be here. But if you know that, so that's it. So it's the four of us in the studio, and then if you're familiar with the work, we're we do a lot, so as you can see, we're improvising all the time, making stuff, but we have a dirty secret. We like to bring on collaborators on projects that fill an expertise that we don't feel comfortable in necessarily. So as you look closely, this is kind of a loosely across the world. There's people all over the place that we've uh, um, collaborated with over the years. And importantly on this project, Gillian Cashin was a huge, um, had huge involvement in the Biennale design of this project we did for, for this year. So we were thinking like, well, I don't design books, none of the studio design books, and we're not good at that. Let's just work with the, our, one of our favorite people in someone who's so good at it just to collaborate with us to make sure that component is taken care of. And this is how we do a lot of other projects. We work with you know, type designers, illustrators, animators, and stuff. So, this team gets sort of developed depending on the project. So Jillian's here somewhere. If you guys have seen the actual edition for the um, Biennale, which I'll show you a little later, um, you can give her a high five for that because it's incredible. Um, all right, so roots. I gotta talk a little bit about myself, unfortunately, just to give you an idea of what's going on. So this is me playing a piano recital, I think like eight. Um, so, I want to reiterate, I'm a musician first, and then somehow I got myself into graphic design. Um, and then I stumbled into this, like, you know, Neville Brody uh, stuff when I was in, like, a teenager, and I thought it would be cool to, like, skateboard and snowboard. So I was like, ooh, this is interesting. You know, I like this, like, type of typography. I didn't know what it was, but I was interested in this stuff. And then at the same time, I started to get into jazz music, and these specific record thrust by Herbie Hancock. I don't know if you guys know about this, but I decided, when I heard this record, I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to learn how to play piano, I'm going to keep playing, practice, I still practice every day. And, and I think it's important to find these periods in your, in your life where, you know, you have this clear direction. You're like, oh my God, I'm so inspired by this. This is what I want to do. So I can, I can literally like redraw the room. I remember hearing this record, I can re redraw the space that I was in, I was so into it. So, and then I started to get into this and you look at the, type, the typography of the Blue Note record, it's actually kind of funny to compare this with the ECM records. This is like a lot more fun. This is like stuffy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but this is really cool. So, you're getting the context of me thinking about stuff in a much larger context of just graphic design, just, you know, the, the visual. This idea of what, what creates an identity 
is much larger than that. So if you look at the zebra, for example, I'm showing you a zebra, and I'm talking about evolution of horses and stuff, but it's kind of pe peculiar to me that this very unique animal is only happening in this space and time. And what's, I think, interesting in France, the concept of terroir, this moment of place, all the conditions come around to form this very special thing in this very special place. And that's something to think about from a design standpoint, that there's a lot more to the story than just typefaces and posters and stuff. Like, so for us to start to think about design in a much larger holistic way becomes quite interesting. And I think we sort of stumbled in this idea of how movement can actually be a very strong signifier by how something looks. So this idea of what a kinetic identity is, and that's something in our studio really specializes in how we approach motion as the formation of the work. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So. So if you think about this, so anything in nature really becomes something that we're, we're used to seeing. We know what magnetism is, we know what gravity is, we're, we're used to these things. So we can think about these from an animation standpoint and, and start to develop concepts based on things that are actually moving and that we're familiar with in nature that aren't just formal, but the behavior of them becomes something that we actually understand. And this can be in, inspiring something that we think about from animation or design. So all this stuff obviously in science is you know, we have trigonometry for this. So we can code these things, we can use these um, formulas to actually generate animation. But I'm just gonna fly through this section. So biomechanics, it gets more interesting when we think about walk cycles of animals. Um, this is a um, Edward Mybridge uh, sequence, which I find quite fascinating. This is the first sort of looping sequence. And for me, this sort of embodies the idea of sort of the kinetic identity, because if I go here, I know each of these stills there's a difference compositionally, but it's under the, the form and the structure of the horse and the, the jockey running is, is the same, but then you catch moments in time to give it a different sensibility. So this idea of using looping cycles or generative cycles starts to give us an opportunity to do stuff that we couldn't do from a manual perspective. And then and then you can convert this into code or you know turn it into formulas for animation or design. So the, it's fun for, for me and I think for us to look at these examples in a context of a graphic designer. I'm just literally pulling Google images of the walk cycles of science imagery. But then if you think about, there's visual language coming through this just by the behavior of the movement. You see this rhythm, you know? And I find this quite fascinating. Um, you know, just like the walk cycle of the caterpillar, you see this composition come through over here. And so for us, like, so we were thinking, what if we just, approach this and add typography to it. This is like a simple, a really simple exercise. This is pretty old now, but this became a point of research and, and experimentation for us to literally just borrow natural motion cycles and natural things to find movement and just applying it to graphic design elements and then doing this over and over again. So that kind of became a huge, a huge sense of, uh, let's see, this inspiration for us working. So then, all of a sudden, this is like a snake cycle, but if you look at this thing moving like this, and then you put a camera on the side of it, you get this really radical sort of treatment of typography by using motion um, as the point to, to, to derive the effect. Um, gets more fun when we start to add this. So, if you think about music, there's, you know, this is late 90s in some probably dark club in London. Um, God knows what he took earlier, um, but, so, but it's interesting to me to think about there's rhythmic patterns that relate to dance. So, same thing, this is the second line dance in New Orleans. There's a specific rhythmic pattern that inspires the movement. There's the same thing in, in classical ballet. You have this connection to movement and music and rhythm. That So you see this, the body, the, the performance, and then the music are all connected. Um, and then what's interesting about that is that when someone's performing, there's this concentration, this focus, this kind of effort that's going through. If you capture stills, there's always an underlying beauty in the work. So this idea that I'm capturing moments of time rather than like constructing something opened up our, uh, I think, lenses of how we can approach design in a different way. And more importantly, you can just see these guys like, you know, synced up and stuff. You can see that connection between the music and the movement. So, real quick, so this is an interesting exercise. So, if I look at time, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, if I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
I can feel the accent, my body feels it, or if I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This feels bouncy, this feels like a serious march, but it's the exact same thing, but I'm just emphasizing moments in time. This is a waltz, one, two, three, two, two, three, but it's still just the same time, just emphasizing periods of time to make the body feel differently. So a little insider secret, if you're ever clapping to a song, always clap on the two and four. If you clap on the one and three, then you should just leave the party. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five. You see it's got a little pop. But if I go one, two, three, four, yeah. Anyway, so. So, cut two. Now you understand all this theory that goes into how we work. Um, all the, the letters are just answers, essentially. So, and I find it interesting, a lot of people have dealt with this subject in art over the years. This is a piece by John DeCesare, I think, reinterpreting a Mozart piece um, visually. But when you look at, uh, this is notation for, for ballet and dance, you start to see the relationship of a visual system coming through through, through choreography in, in music. So for me, I started to see this like connection between the body, the music, the form, and this kind of trifecta of elements coming together, which you know really provides a lot of really interesting uh, possibilities. There's just more examples of stuff. Even, even this futurist painting, like you know, this idea of capturing time, um, you get this really expressive gesture in the work that I find really interesting. And it's, and if you guys noticed, if you saw the posters around this around the city, they're they're pretty uh, radical and jarring in a way. But it's because it's coming out of this idea that you're capturing moment. Um, so yeah, that's just, this is a cool like I'm, this. This is a Jean Baldessari piece. It's like I'm just waiting for the balls to fall. So I get this sense of anxiety almost. But I like that. You know, I get there's this tension that comes through in the composition. Um, so here's a good example of just the process. So. And I'll get into this further. We would design this first, then start to version and create stuff, and then it goes into the static form. So it's more interesting to us to create cycles of motion and rhythmic sort of patterns in motion that then we can apply and then break out to anything else. So you can see from a production standpoint, this is really efficient and really fast to just make stuff. You know, Because we have this set up, we can version and make stuff really quickly. Um, so. For, for those who, I don't know why I keep showing this because it's really dating me. Um, this is a, a minority report. But we're essentially, and especially in the US and maybe parts of Asia, the, the formats of design live essentially in this context. So the way, the way we are working with animation and design is basically teed up perfectly for the, how we consume design content now, whether on social media, you're on Snapchat, Instagram, whatever. Like those are the places that our clients are working in making sure that we're versioning and so we have to think about how design works in this context. So what I've showed you before sets up a perfect way into exploring and developing design work within a context that does not, no longer live in the fixed format poster or in an edition. It, it really lives in this world that doesn't have a format anymore. So this forces us to think about design in a different way um, and produce work in a much different way. So. So what happens is we are, we're limited with Adobe, we're limited with like Cinema 4D, we're limited with the software that exists. So we have to be creative to create new things. So to bring this back to music, you think about the keys of the piano. This was developed from an organ like 2,000 years ago. And the harpsichord was developed because people were probably tired of the organ. And then harpsichord doesn't allow you to play soft or loud, so a piano was developed to be more expressive. And then synthesizers were developed to be more expressive. And then throw it all out. Now we have computers and hardware to be more expressive. And you basically can create anything just with a computer. So if we look at that in the context of design, it's the same, but unfortunately Adobe really dominates the landscape for what we can do. So for us to create tools and, and actually software to generate the work becomes a more fascinating entry point to design because we break the limitations of what the harpsichord did. So we got to create a piano or create a synthesizer, or create something else to allow us to create work in a certain way. Um, so these are some examples of some um, applications that we developed for a specific client. So you can kind of see how not only are we designing the final piece, we're designing the actual element of the software to control the work. 
So we're developing tools to do the work for us. So again, about production and speed, we can, I can render a still, I can render a poster, I can render an animation, in a matter of seconds, I can produce work that I couldn't do by hand. Um, and there's some more examples of this. So I'm gonna move to a thing called slow design. For those of you who have taken down the path of drawing fonts, I think it's important that I show you a lot of this radical, technical, you know, like, teched out stuff. However, if I don't have a fundamental understanding of graphic design, typography, and form at a micro level, then a lot of the work, if I put in the context of animation, it's gonna start looking like cheesy screensavers or like hacker artwork. So, for me, going through the exercise of drawing high faces over the last, say, five or six years, has forced me to have an understanding of form at a micro level and really understand negative space and the details of design compositions in a way that I would not have been able to do without forcing myself to wake up to rework the S day after day. So if you know, if anybody knows a type designer well, then they're complicated people because it's like a constant like struggle. Like you wake up, you look at your work, like, ooh, this looks like shit today, oh, but I gotta do it again. I gotta keep working on the A, I keep working on the A. 11 years later, it's like, okay, maybe I should release the font now. Um, but, so these things are never done. So, luckily for me, I have too much stuff going on, so I just decide it's finished and I don't care anymore and it's done. Um, but I can imagine some of my fellow type designers have a much more painful uh, life. But here's some examples of this. Here's some things that I've done over the years. Um, continue. So I like drawing fonts. Um, but it's the opposite of making software. <laughs> yeah, a little, little, little drop one in there. Um, so, if you guys want to buy them. <laughs> so, all right, let's mash all that up. This is the output. So you got Wayne Shorter, guy on acid and whatever, and then some type and then borderless. So then we have... All right, no, no, there it really is. Show you how it works. All right, this is what the fuck. Hey, talk to me. some extra ringers, but we, like I said, if we're improv improvising and just working and being in the moment, we're able to produce tons of work, and I've given you sort of the secret of how we're able to do so much so quickly. Anyway, about this interesting visual identity we were up to, what's viral? This is viral. Also, this is viral. So. We were having discussions like how do we how do we deal with this? And I was like, you know, formally we gotta find a way to like translate this, you know, this expansion of information quickly, but also there's a sense of humor in it because you know, viral images are weird and funny and have such a laced in story, so it just made sense to find content to work with in the case. And then on top of that, there's this idea of typography in a viral viral sense. You have like memes and weird hacker, like uppercase, lowercase. So we were like, well, how do we make this like, you know, agreeable for a graphic designer? So we looked at a lot of Wolfgang Weinart artwork and kind of back and forth with this as sort of a, a starting point. And you know, with the team and working with Jillian, 
we were trying to find a typographic language that would speak to this. So for those of you who've seen the edition and seen the posters, like it's intense and really busy and, and kind of pretty wild, but this is all sort of derived from this, like we're trying to make it bad, but also make it really good. Um, so here's some examples of just, just some of the sketches that Jillian put together. And then we were just looking at these examples and immediately two popped out. They kind of, they start to get this tension. It's like wrong, but right, uppercase, lowercase, competing sizes. So we're, I found this very fascinating, very interesting. So then the issue is we had to deal with images. So we kind of settled on this as a, a starting point to then build out from the, the typographic language of the, the work. Um, and then me, in, in the meantime, we were doing tests to deal with how could we you know, integrate this photography within the type. So um, Daniel, who saw the earlier picture, his actual real name that we call him in the studio is Computer Boy. I'm not kidding. He actually has a tattoo of a Computer Boy on his ankle. I'm not kidding. Um, it might be an HR problem in some places, but in our studio it's all good. Um, so here's some examples of stuff he was playing with. So we were, we were like, how do we mix this in a way? And then eventually we, we created a system Oh yeah, here's some of the photos. So actually, yeah, our studio is peppered into the photos. Like, that's me doing like the this dance. Yeah, so you can see us. And then you have these random photos. This is just a selection of the images that you actually see in the in the work. And then, so what we did is hacked After Effects in a way to actually we created a generative software using After Effects to then build out and then produce this stuff. It's way too complicated to explain, but it's essentially what, what we can do, rather than using software, we can hack existing software to do the things that we need to do. So this is just an example of this thing coming together. You can see on the right, looks just like the posters. So from there, then this is kind of the, the core asset. You can see the viral images pushing through. And then here comes just all the assets that we were just exporting. Like this isn't, I don't, we, we spend 10 seconds just exporting these. All this stuff is really quick. Um, and then this is just some of the examples that you'll see in the street, um, some of the posters. So all this were just exports. We didn't hand put this stuff. It was like we just exported a selection. We're like, that's the one. That's the one we're picking. So for those of you who are used to designing posters or doing work, it, it's an uncomfortable feeling for doing design work. It's an uncomfortable feeling to be like, wait a minute, like that's the thing we're printing? Like we just exported it? And so, as you get used to it, it becomes much easier, but all this is just us curating a selection of the exports, and then we're deciding that's when we're going to use. So you can see the possibilities are kind of endless, so we can always create variations uh, kind of infinitely that are going to be different. But you have this, just like the MyBridge thing, the loop, it always has the same structure, the same sort of quality underneath it that gives it the, the, the look. So we can create animations, posters, um, interactive pieces at all different scales really quickly and always guarantee the consistently consistent quality of the work but also have this dynamic expression in it as well um, here's yeah, some more stuff yeah as you can see so it becomes really efficient for, for us to make this is really quick because we've set up the system so then we can just input text change render input text render input text render so we have a system that becomes really efficient and you can see how this comes to life and then here's here is that. So what was really difficult, and I think about this project was how do we translate this into a editorial piece? Because you know we can't just export each page. So I think unfortunately, Jillian had the task of trying to manually recreate this feel somehow within the complex place of a book, which I still don't understand how she figured it out, but it worked. So this is an export of the. Uh, the poster, and here's some initial sort of examples of how this is coming together within the, the edition. And I, and I remember I saw this, I was like, whoa. I was like, how, what's going on here? But it's so cool and so interesting, and it has the same tension, the same quality as the work that we created in the identity. So I think it's interesting to see, even within the details of the typography at this level, you're still getting that quality in the work. And that was, this is all done manually. Um, which, yeah, I don't know. If you find her after this lecture, you can ask her how she did it, but I still don't know. Um, so and then here's some examples that you've seen in the street. Um, so these are all just exports. Everything is just an export. Um, so there you go. You guys have seen this stuff. Here's the cover. Here's the final, some pieces from the edition. 
this is actually one of my favorite slides, just to see all this, comp it works, you know, it has this like, complex typographic language, but it works, um, and I find it really fascinating. And then, you know, more importantly. <laughs> um, so, to conclude, so this idea of a kinetic identity, is concepts that relate to the passage of time, and how visual systems created by the means of animation behaviors or computation, so coding or whatnot. Um, and so this is how, you know, we're taught, you know, make a still, make some storyboards, maybe you animate it, oh, maybe we need a website. So this is how we work. Maybe we have a jazz groove, let's see what happens if we, that generates some type, or maybe we have some still that we, like, ramble with some code, like, there's no entry point. So we, as I showed you earlier, we can come at design from a much bigger perspective. You look at, like, the, the bouncy balls, for example. What if I make a type be like a bouncy ball? Like, that's a totally different way of thinking about design because it's not thinking about it in a fixed format static sense or may I say Swiss style. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be complicated that I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and to finish, I want to come back to this idea of improvisation and this idea of beginner's mind. And what I mean by this is a lot of people, like, do you have a creative block? Do you ever run into, click, you run into issues in your creative work, creating work? And, and my answer is no, because if you open up a tutorial on YouTube of something new and put yourself in the position to try something that's out of your comfort zone, you immediately have new ideas, every time. And it, but, it's, but the problem is, is that you kind of, it feels kind of shitty when you get to there and you know that you suck at it. But that's actually a good thing if you flip it on its head, knowing that if I just do this 10 minutes a day for the next you know, 20 years, and maybe I become an expert, but at least I have new ideas by putting myself in this idea of a beginner's mind and actually receiving this moment of learning in a way that's going to have a positive output and not worry that I'm going to be, it's going to be difficult. Um, so getting back to this idea of improvisation, if I'm playing music or if I'm working, it's finding a space where all of this stuff disappears and I can just do things and not worry. Maybe like 90% of the stuff I make is total shit. But there's going to be some, some things that come through this process that you can come out and then pick that are very interesting that then you can produce and, and, and continue to develop further. So if you're improvising, you're not critical, you're not comparing, you know, everybody's looking at Instagram comparing stuff. Just, just make stuff. Don't, you're not expecting this is going to win awards. You're not going to, you know, feel like it's going to suck or whatever. It's just making stuff and enjoying that. Um, so to conclude, this is a, a little discussion between John Baptiste and Wayne Shorter. It's a, he's a pianist from New Orleans, and Wayne Shorter is, for me, probably the most important musician influence in my life. Just kind of discussing the same idea in the sense of music, but uh, well, are, you are you trying to relate to, to that, that feeling? feeling? What, what are you? What's, what's your, your intent? intent? Well, well, actually, the intent now is to uh, uh, throw, throw away, away it, 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 kind, kind of put away him and learn, learn and to study, study stuff. stuff. Uh, and then and I, I always was heard because Miles was the only one who would talk like, like this. this. He said, say, Wayne. He said, hey, hey, Wayne. Wayne. Do you ever feel like, like you want to play? play. Uh, he said, he you want to play like you don't know how to play? play. play. <laughs> and then he said, said, do you feel like you like, like to play music that doesn't sound like music? That doesn't sound, I know it's right, but you know it's and I have, I have a tape, a tape of Charlie Parker, Parker giving me a lesson, and, and the, 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 the student, student says, Mr. Parker, Parker, I have to learn all these scales, I have to oh, memorize all these scales, and the said, yes, and after you finish, you finish, finish learning them, learn them, them, forget them. them. Right. right. Play as, as if you don't know. know. All this stuff, stuff you're not playing scales, scale. you're playing you straight from the heart. heart. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Je sais, tu peux refaire l'annonce, tu me proches. Et euh, 
fait des événements euh, ah, oui. et du salon des éditeurs. Mmh. Pas de questions du tout. <rire> Donc, bon, Alors, déjà merci, mais c'était super. Je pense qu'ils sont tous époustouflés. Thank you very much. Ah, really flabbergasted by this presentation. Yeah, merci. <rire> Euh, et on vous euh, annonce donc la suite. On est un peu victime de notre succès. Euh, voilà, c'est la première année que des conférences euh, font ça comble tout au long euh, du week-end. Bon, c'est super, ça nous fait grand plaisir, mais désolé pour les autres. Mais sachez que toutes les conférences seront en ligne d'ici deux semaines. Euh, pour le programme de la journée, donc cet après-midi, euh, il y a des conférences à partir de, de 14h. Euh, bureau 205, Michel de petit Didier, Fabrication Maison et euh, Isabelle Vigo, Guillaume Lano pour la SAIF. Euh, à 15h30, vous pourrez rencontrer les éditeurs à l'espace Bouchardon. Il y a aussi deux expositions, donc les éditeurs euh, 369, Bureau 205 et Back Office avec euh, voilà, les différents deux. Et euh, n'oubliez pas, donc ceux qui sont encore là demain, euh, au Halle du Marché. Euh, il y a un brunch qui est offert par l'association design euh, Chaumont Design Graphique. Et euh, pendant ce brunch, il y aura aussi un débat conférence avec euh, nos amis de Forme des Luttes à midi. Voilà. Oui, et des ateliers euh, tout au long du week-end, euh, ces après-midi à l'espace Couchardon et au ciné. Merci beaucoup, Suzanne. Et merci aussi pour la traduction parce que ça ne devait pas être euh, super évident avec euh, les techniques mitraillettes. Euh, donc, euh, merci beaucoup, beaucoup, Suzanne. Thank you.